you never know what hangs in the balance of an invitation. When 32 years ago, I got a phone call from Dee Bowman while I was living in Dallas saying, come to Southside and learn to preach the gospel. I knew it was a great opportunity, but I really had no idea of, of what that invitation would really mean. Not only in terms of the tremendous blessing that Dee and Norma and their family have been to me and in my life, thank you, but this whole church. Um, I know that many of you were not here uh, those many years ago, but many of you were. And it's some of the most cherished memories that Janice and I have of those early years together here uh, where our first child was born and where we began the, the work that we've endeavored to do ever since in trying to proclaim the gospel and live it out in our lives and encourage other people to follow Jesus as well. And it's an honor beyond uh, all description to be invited to come back and to participate again in the 42nd, can you imagine that, the 42nd edition of these lectures. And like I said, you never know what hangs in the balance of an invitation. And as you go through life and schedules get really hectic and busy and there's conflicts, you have to be thoughtful about all of the invitations that you accept. And so when Bubba called and, and asked if, if I would speak uh, at this year's lectures, it was not one of those things that I really had to spend much time thinking through, even though there's a lot of things that are going on in my life. It was a quick yes. I want to be there. I want to be involved, and I want to have an opportunity to whatever degree I can to give back to you just some portion of what you have meant to us. You all are special, and we didn't want to miss out. We didn't want to miss out on what we know that this week is all about. Tonight, I, I want to invite you, whoever you may be, to follow Jesus. That's what this lesson is all about, that you could step into a relationship with Jesus as teacher, Jesus as Lord, and I hope as Jesus as Savior, that would be an invitation that even at the beginning of it, you may recognize this is something significant, but perhaps can not possibly imagine what all it would mean, where all it might take you, and how it might change your life both now and forever. You may be here tonight thinking, well, that sounds like an interesting proposition, an invitation to follow Jesus, but I don't believe that that's an invitation for me. I can't follow Jesus because, you see, I'm nothing like Jesus. I don't know a whole lot about Jesus, maybe. That's where you, some of you may be coming from tonight. But I know enough about him to know that there's a big, big gap between who he is and who I am. And I'm not sure that I'm Jesus follower material. And even if I were interested in following him, I'm not so sure that he would be interested in me following him. I'm interested in him, perhaps, but is he interested in me? After all, I've got a lot of doubts which Shane's going to be speaking about in a few moments. I've got a past, and I don't have any doubt that some of you have a past. I don't have any doubt that all of us have a past, that there could be things that should show up in the news or be put up on a screen that we didn't know about, about our worst moment in our past, that we don't, we don't know that we could even lift up our heads for shame. So maybe because of some of the things in your past, some of the doubts that you have, maybe even some of the struggles and temptations and even addictions that you have tonight, you wonder, could I possibly follow Jesus? Would Jesus allow someone like me to be a follower of his? And the answer to that is yes, he would. Because Jesus made it very plain in Luke chapter 5, We'll get it in a moment. Luke chapter 5 and in verse 32, he said, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus said, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. 
I'm calling them to come to me. I'm calling them into a relationship with me whereby things in their life that are out of order, things that are disordered, things that they can't quite seem to get right, they can be called upon and find a way to make the changes that they so need to make. I didn't call the righteous, those perhaps who think that they've got it all together, but I've come to call those who know that they do not. Now, this was something that came in response to a question that Jesus was being asked by some of the Pharisees who said, why is it that your disciples uh, do certain things and why is it that you as their leader engage in fellowship, you sit down and you eat and drink with, with sinners? Why is it that you eat and drink with sinners? You see, the Pharisees who asked that question had a sort of philosophy about being one of their followers, they would say, if you can change, we'll let you follow us. If you can get your act together, if you can straighten up and fly right, if you can be moral and spiritual enough to become part of the few and the proud, then we'll let you make the cut and you can be one of us. But Jesus seems to come with a completely different approach and says, no, if you follow me, you can change. You see, the order is significantly different, isn't it? If you change, you can follow us, said the Pharisees. But Jesus is saying, no, I want you to follow me because in me and in this relationship with me, you're going to find a dynamic. You're going to find a power. You're going to find something that is a result of the connection that your faith has with my faithfulness that is going to enable you to make changes in your life that maybe you've tried to make before but have never been able to stick but if you follow me, the changes, they're going to happen. In the statement that we had on the screen in Luke 5, 32, Jesus said, I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And maybe we're a little bit offended by the word sinners, but that's what Jesus came for, and that's all of us. And ultimately, a sinner is someone who has strayed off the path. That there's an idea of how we ought to be and then there's the reality of how we are. And a sinner is someone who's missed the target, who's missed the mark, who's like an arrow flying toward the target, but something goes amiss, goes awry, and it's beginning to, to wander off. And so Jesus says, no, I've come to bring a course correction to those who are willing to look to me as the standard and get in line and try to follow me so that they can, again, make changes that they never imagined that they could possibly make before. And I'll help you bring your actions into alignment with your ideals. And to show you the power that Jesus has to actually do that, I want to share with you the story of Jesus' most famous disciple and how he was an arrow that not just went astray once, but found it very difficult to ever be on target for very long. But as a result of following Jesus and especially following Jesus to the place that Jesus would ultimately lead him, found the power to change and to become much more like his Lord than I think he would have ever thought possible. And so we begin with a passage that describes for us this initial calling of Peter to be a follower of Jesus. It says in Luke chapter 5 and verse 1 that Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. That's the Sea of Galilee. But a lake is perhaps a more apt description, a large and significant lake, but a lake nonetheless. And the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. So Jesus is this preacher, a rabbi who goes around and he, he preaches and he teaches and, and crowds were drawn to Jesus. People who were nothing like Jesus wanted to listen to Jesus. They could perhaps tell that Jesus liked them. And they were drawn to hear what he had to say because he spoke to them not as the scribes and the Pharisees, but in a way that was unlike anything they had ever heard before in their lives. And so as they listened to him there, we find that among them uh, was uh, Peter, but we'll get to him in a moment. At the water's edge, there where Jesus was, was preaching, there were two boats. The gospel is full of these interesting details. Two boats that are there on the beach where Jesus is teaching. And they were left bare, there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. You see, they would go out in the evening and catch the fish because when the water in the lake would cool, the fish would come to the surface. 
And they with shallow casting nets would throw their nets and gather in fish. And then when the sun rose and the water began to heat up, the fish would go down to the depths so they would bring their boats to shore, bring in their catch, and then wash and dry and, and fold up their nets so they'd be ready to go out again the next evening. And so Jesus is there teaching by the sea. He notices these two boats, and there's these men who had been fishing, washing their nets. And it says in verse 3 that he got into one of the boats. Jesus just does things like this. He just steps into one of the boats, and he, he says it's a boat belonging to Simon. Now, I said that we're going to talk about Peter, who is one of Jesus' most famous disciples, because you and I know him as Peter, but that wasn't the name that his mama gave him. The name his mama gave him was the name Simon. But the reality is that God and Jesus did such a work in this man's life that you couldn't hardly recognize him from before. And we're going to see that Jesus is going to not only change his name, but change his character to match. So Simon is standing there who becomes known to us as Peter. And Jesus asks him to put his boat out a little bit of a distance from the shore And then Jesus sat down and he taught the people from the boat. So there's this crowd, and you can understand the the reasoning behind this. They're all pressed up against him, and Jesus needs a little bit of space. So he he just asks Peter, hey, can you just row a little ways out from shore, and I'll just sit in the boat and teach the people. So Peter is willing to do this, interrupts his drying and washing of his nets in order to serve this teacher. And then in verse 4, it says that when he had finished speaking, that is, Jesus got through with his lesson, he said to Simon, now put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Now, we've just talked about why that would seem to be quite unreasonable. And Peter is the expert here. He's the professional fisherman, and you would think that he would be the one that you would look to for lessons on how to fish and let Jesus do the lessons on how to teach the Word of God. But Peter's quite respectful, and he says to Jesus, Master, an expression of respect. You're a rabbi. You're a master of the law. You're the teacher. And I want you to know we've hurt, worked hard all night. We've been out here fishing all night long, doing what we're experts at doing, just like you're an expert at what you're doing. But we, in spite of our expertise, have caught nothing. The fish are just not here right now. And if they're not here in the night when they're supposed to be there, we we know for sure they're not going to be there in the daytime now that they've gone down even deeper. But then Peter says something that's remarkable. He says, but because you say so. I wouldn't do this for anyone else, but I've had enough of an experience with you already and sitting here listening to the things that you've had to say because you say so, because you asked. I'll let down the nets. And so Peter went, and when they had done so, because that's where the blessing always is. It's not in the hearing or even in the believing. It is and when, when the belief leads us to the acting. So when they had done so, when they let down their nets, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. It's an amazing event. It's, a, it's an astonishing sort of thing to, to have happen. And, and Luke records it for us as, as the historian of these events because this is how it came that Simon Peter began to follow Jesus. And they had this great catch of fish, and so they had to signal to their partners and the other boat to come over and help them. And so they filled both boats so full that they began, it says, to sink. And then when Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees. Jesus there in the boat with him, and he falls down at his knees. And he doesn't say, hey, let's go into business together. I'll give you 25%. Never seen anything like this. Now, Peter falls at Jesus' knees and says, go away from me, not master, but Lord, for I am a sinful man. You'll never know who you are until you see him for who he is. 
You may see him as a great teacher and a master, someone to show some respect to, but when you come to experience the power of the Word made flesh, of the eternal God assuming hum, human, a, a human life in your presence and commanding nature in ways that no one has ever imagined before, when you see that with your own eyes and you experience it for yourself, you see yourself in a whole new light. And whatever Peter had thought of himself before, he recognizes now that the gap between who Jesus is and who he is is seemingly an unbridgeable gap. And I do not belong in the presence of someone as great and as holy and as good and as powerful as you are. So go away from me. I can't be a follower of yours. But then Jesus leans into that tension and that space between who Peter was and who Jesus was, and he said to him, Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. I have a job for you. I have a mission for you. You've drawn near to that which is holy, and you've been attracted to that. And as you got close, you saw the inherent danger of being that close to that which is holy. But I have a mission for you that's going to change the trajectory of your, your life. You can remain Simon the fisherman who will live and die, and no one will remember anything about you. Or you can follow me and become more than you ever imagined possible. And so they pulled their boats up, and they left everything, and they followed him. My guess is that tonight you can see yourself in one of the phases of Peter's trajectory as he becomes a follower of Jesus here. Maybe you're at that stage where you just need to sit and listen to the things that he has to say. Maybe you just need to get one of the Bibles that can be provided for you free of charge and just start reading one of the Gospels and finding out who this Jesus is. Or maybe you've been doing that long enough that you're ready to, to do something different than the way you've always done it before. You've always done it your way. And the reality is that sometimes the way that you do things doesn't turn out so well. And so you wouldn't do things differently just because of anybody, but because he asks. Maybe you're ready to take that one small step of faith to do things differently, then do it just because you say so. And when that begins to happen, what happens in our lives is that our little faith begins to intersect with his great faithfulness. And amazing things begin to happen. And when you've begun to experience those changes in your life, you're ready then to leave behind everything and to follow him. Well, Peter's calling was dramatic, but his transformation was rather erratic. A dramatic calling, but an erratic following as, as, as Peter begins his journey with Christ as a follower of his, having these tendencies to be um, rather volatile. A volatile kind of person seems to be how Peter was. He was the kind of guy who was off to a fast start but tended to stumble down the stretch. When I was in high school, I was an 800-meter guy. And we had two of us on the track team. And one, one day the other guy came up lame with, with something and so the coach said, we need somebody else to, to run along with Kelly over here in the 800. Who, 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 who can do that? And there was, a, there was a guy on our team, he was, he was always impetuous. He was always ready for anything. His name was Lonnie Dozier. And Lonnie just shot up his hand and said, coach, I'm ready. I can run the 800. Now, Lonnie was a sprinter. And he was a pretty fast guy. And he was full of confidence, full of himself. And he was just sure if coach would put him in the 800, he'd show Kelly and the rest of the field how this is done. So the 800 is two laps around. And we took off, and I remember as an experienced half-miler seeing Lonnie just shoot off into the distance. I mean, the gun went off, and he was gone. 
And it was in White Oak, Texas. And if you've ever been to the White Oak track, it was kind of an unusual configuration. The football stadium stands on, on one side was like they normally are, but on the other side, the visitor side, they were actually inside the track, a small bleachers, set of bleachers between the edge of the football field and the track. Well, Lonnie makes it around in the very front, the whole first four or 500 meters. But as, as we're going along, I'm, not, I'm beginning to notice that Lonnie's getting closer and closer. And the second we got behind the cover of that bleachers on the visitor side, Lonnie just dives off into the grass and rolls. <laughs> he is done. If it had been the 500 meter dash, Lonnie would have won. He was quick to begin, but he wasn't too strong on the finish. And that seems to be in a lot of the stories that we read about Peter, kind of the way that he was. He was the first one of the disciples in. Whatever it was, I'm in. And sometimes the first one out. We know the stories of how he was not consistent. He showed promise as a leader, but can you really count on him? Is he reliable? And so often the answer just seems to come up, not really. There's the famous story of Peter seeing Jesus on the storm, walking on the water. Lord, if that's really you, command me to come out. I'll, I'll come out on the boat and I'll walk to you. And Jesus says, come. And Peter bails out of the boat and he's doing fine and notices the wind and the waves. Taking his eyes off Jesus, he begins to sink and Jesus has to rescue him. And he asks him, and I've always wondered in what tone of voice Peter, or Jesus speaks to Peter here, but he says, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And then there's the story of how they were up near Caesarea uh, and Philippi, and, and, and Jesus asks the disciples, what's the word on the street out here? Who do people say that I, the Son of Man, am? And and the disciples say, well, some of them say you're John the Baptist, raised from the dead. And some others say that you're Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the other great prophets of the Old Testament that's, that's come back to life in the world. And so they were all excited about this. But then Jesus says, okay, well, who do you say that I, the Son of Man, am? That's an interesting question because... We all know what the word on the street is, but what do you say? Who do you think Jesus is? And all the disciples kind of reflecting on this and thinking about it. And, and then Peter just says, I'll tell you who you are. You're the Christ, the son of the living God. I've seen the things that you can do, and I know who you are, and Jesus commends Peter for this. And in fact, this is where Jesus gives Peter his name. Peter, Cephas, the rock. How Peter must have felt so good about himself on that occasion. I'm becoming more than I was before. This following Jesus thing is changing me and I'm seeing things I never thought I'd see and I'm becoming someone I never thought I could become. And Jesus sees it in me too and he just gave me a nickname, The Rock. The very next thing that Matthew tells us happens is that Jesus begins to tell the disciples, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and I'm going to run afoul of the leaders there and I'm going to suffer many things at their hands, be beaten and killed. And on the third day, I will rise again. And Scripture tells us that Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him, saying, this will never happen to you. And that's where Jesus says some of the most chilling words in all the Bible to me is where he turns to, to Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. For you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. Peter the rock. Peter, you're Satan. 
unstable, impetuous, inconsistent. And all of that were merely signals toward the big one that was to come. For things actually went just as Jesus predicted that they would. And after the Last Supper where Jesus tells them about what is going to happen and institutes the Lord's Supper and, and all of these things, washes the disciples' feet and all, and all of this, he, he, be, he then tells them <clears throat> that this very night, all of you are going to betray me. All of you are going to run away. And that's where Peter then says, even if, Lord, even if all fall away, I will never fall away. Or he goes on a little later to say, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. Jesus, these other disciples, I'm not too sure about them, but I'm telling you when it comes to Peter, when it comes to your rock, I've got your back. You don't have to worry about me. I'm with you all the way to the end. And look, Jesus, this thing about you dying, no, if it takes this, I'm willing to die in order that you can live, Jesus. And I think Peter meant what he said. But then Jesus is arrested. And when Peter tries to take off the high priest servant's head and gets only his ear, Jesus tells him to put his sword away. And Peter loses his equilibrium and he's just not sure that this thing is turning out the way that he had thought that it would turn out. And the next thing you know, they're taking Jesus away and Peter finds himself tagging along far, far in the back, watching to see how this thing would end. And while Jesus was on trial before the high priest and other leaders of the Jews, Peter is warming himself beside a charcoal fire. When a little servant girl comes up and says, hey, weren't you with Jesus? And Peter just basically says, no, 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 no. You got the wrong guy. Not me. And someone else comes along and says, no, no, you, you kind of look like one of those that were with him. I think that you were. And he, he says, no, I, I swear with an oath. That's not me. I'm not one of his disciples. And then finally it says when the third person says, no, I'm pretty sure you're one of his, he says that he began to call down curses. And he swore to them, I do not know the man. And that's when the rooster crowed, as Jesus had predicted, and Peter went out and wept bitterly. So crushed, so disappointed, so disillusioned, so confused, and so full of shame. Is there anything as bad as shame? Is there anything as bad as shame? Peter is bowed down with shame. And, and even when Jesus rises again the third day and appears to Peter and the others, I think this feeling, feeling of, of shame was overwhelming him so much. And then we're told on, on a third occasion that Peter has a, an experience with Jesus when Jesus in John the 21st chapter is on the beach when they come back from a fishing trip because Peter maybe has begun to think, you know, there's, there's no future for me in this following Jesus, but not after what I've done. I, I thought I was making some progress, but the difference between who Jesus is and who I am is so immense that there is no hope for me to be one of his people anymore, one of his followers, someone that he would entrust anything with, and so I'm, I'm going back to fishing so it's interesting that Jesus, while they're fishing, stands on the beach and prepares a charcoal fire. Brings them ashore. and They eat some fish together on the beach. And Jesus pulls Peter aside and says, Peter, do you love me? I think that's an interesting question, isn't it? He didn't say, Peter, did you go forward at church? Or, Peter, 
Um, are you really, do you really feel badly about what you did? The, the question and the central question always, Peter, do you love me? And Peter answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And then Jesus says, tend my lambs. And then he said, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Feed my sheep. And then he says a third time, do you love me? And he was grieved because Jesus asked him the third time, the same number of times as he had denied the Lord. He is asked to affirm his love and his loyalty to his Lord. And Jesus says again for the third time, feed my sheep. I have a place for you. I not only want you to follow me, but I'm entrusting you with so much. These flock, this, these people who, who follow me, they need leadership. And I see in you, Peter, so much more than what you have been so far. And now that you have seen what I have done for you, when you have seen the lengths to which I will go in laying down my life, to ransom you and taking it back up again to demonstrate that I am the Lord of life. I'm ready now to trust you with everything. And then he says to him at the end in verse 19, Peter, follow me. And you know, that's when Simon began to live up to the name Peter. The rock. Because it was about a month after this event in the same city where Jesus had been crucified and where Peter had denied him, that Peter stood up and publicly preached that Jesus was the resurrected Son of God and that he and the others were eyewitnesses of his resurrection and they called upon all the people to turn and repent. 3,000 people were, were so moved by the power and the conviction of the testimony that Peter and the others gave that they, that they were willing to follow Jesus themselves and were baptized on that day of Pentecost. Eventually, as Peter continued to go about so boldly preaching Jesus, it began to get him into some serious trouble. We're told on one occasion in Acts, the third chapter, that he heals a man who had been lame from his birth, who was laid at the, the gate of the temple. And the man was looking up at Peter and John, and he was hoping that they would give him some money. And Peter looked at him and said, I, I don't have any silver or gold, but what I have I'm going to give to you. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And the man was recovered the full use of his legs. And he began to leap and to shout for joy, and it grew such a, drew such a crowd together that it just gave Peter an opportunity to tell more people about how Jesus had been raised from the dead and how Jesus was the one who had restored this man that they all knew to have been lame from birth to a full measure of health. And it drew so much attention that it drew the attention of the rulers of the people, the same ones before whom Jesus had been tried and convicted and in whose courtyard Peter had denied him three times and called to account before these authorities, Peter began to speak to them. And these are his words. It says that Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but God raised from the dead that this man stands before you healed. That's a rock. That's a man laying it all on the line. He wasn't preaching to a group of people who loved to hear preaching. He was preaching to the very ones who had crucified him, and he lays it at their feet. 
In great boldness and courage, he demonstrates that following Jesus has made Peter into a completely different kind of person. Do you need to change? Are you sick and tired of who you are and being filled with shame and disappointment over your weakness, over your failures, over your flaws? And maybe you're even growing cynical at humanity in general and even at yourself in in particular because all of the efforts that you've ever made to change before have only resulted in failure. But have you ever followed someone like Peter's Lord? Have you ever been loved that much? Have you ever had someone to stand with that much courage and invite you to follow them? Do you think that maybe that could make a difference in who you are? Eventually, the story continues on, and Peter says about Jesus to these men that he's the stone. He's the stone you builders rejected who has become the cornerstone. He's the rock. I I may be a a rock, but he is the rock. And I've learned to lean my life upon him. And as I lean my life upon him, I'm becoming more and more like him. You see, when I started off, I was Simon. I was not a rock. I was anything but it. But as I follow Jesus, I have become more and more like him. And, And now I'm Peter. I'm the rock, and I'm building my life on the sure foundation, the cornerstone that is Jesus Christ. And salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. And we'll close with this. When they, when they saw the courage, not the fickleness, not the cowardice, not the volatility, not the weakness when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled and ordinary men. They were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Christianity isn't about what you bring to Jesus or impressing him enough to earn a place on his team. It's about the grace of Jesus lifting you up to make you more like him. Do you need to change? If you do, then there's good news. Jesus says to us all, follow me. Thank you so much.